Hi, Jenna. Awesome, excited. There we go. There we go. I'm quite excited. Quite intimidating to be uh, interviewing a TV anchor and a pro who does this for a living. <laughs> Not at all. You're so good at it. You're so good at it. Ah, there we go. There we go. I just want to make sure we go live. I see we're live. Are we live? Yes. I just want to, I want to get the technology out the way because there's something I need to do on my Facebook. Are we live? Can you see us? Yes, yes we are live. We are live. Excellent. I'm so excited. I can't wait. I can hardly wait. Okay, I'm just waiting for it to come up on my Facebook so I can... Um, So I can share it. Seki. No problem. Thank you for your patience, Jenna. Absolutely. <laughs> and I can see people are already joining us. Are people joining us already? That's excellent. <laughs> are you sharing it on your Facebook page as well? Yes, I've shared it on my page, my profile, and I'm also hosting a watch party. So it's going to be a great time. I'm so excited. Good afternoon, everybody. We're just getting through technology and going live. I'm trying to make my broadcast a public one, so I can't see us live yet. Okay, let me leave that be. It's just interesting that we can do this from our homes with technology and uh, it's such a great, a great opportunity to be able to do it, you know? Absolutely. And we are not that far from each other. We stay about, I'd say, 15 minutes away from each other. But due to Corona, we've not been able to, to do this. See each time. other. Hmm. Yeah, we haven't been able to see each other in such a long time. So... Are you on Facebook live, right? Yes, I can see us. We are live on Facebook, on your page, on your profile, rather. Okay, I can't see me, but if you can see us and people are joining us, then we should go. Yes, I'll also uh, share it to you on your WhatsApp as well. And on my page, yeah? Okay, on my WhatsApp. I'll send it to your WhatsApp for you. Thank you, Jenna. We're just getting through technology. <laughs> there we go, I've sent it to you. That should take you straight to it. Okay, great. I just wanna, um, I have to make this post um, public so that many people can see it. And there we go. So good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> good afternoon, everybody joining us. Um, good afternoon, Jenna, Jenna Lee. It's wonderful. It's so exciting. I haven't seen you in forever. Almost want to grab out over the screen and give you a hug and kiss. <laughs> this, this, um, Lockdown has certainly been uh, challenging on friendships and girl time, but I'm very excited and a very warm welcome Facebook family to everybody joining us this afternoon. Um, we are so, so excited and in for a big treat. But before we go ahead and while Jenna gets a few minutes to settle in, I want to tell you a little story. Jenna, listen to this, you're gonna love it. So it was my 30 year reunion and this is how Succeed started. At a 30 year high school reunion, the high school sports boy, or in the movies as they call it, the jock, um, connected with the cheerle cheerleader, me, me, I was the cheerleader, wow. still had the legs. And 
<laughs> and we connected over a class project, a community project, and co-led it in the community that we grew up in. After that, uh, God gave a word to him about, you know, the Lord gives the seed to the sower. And we started to engage in many, many interesting conversations, long, beautiful, juicy conversations. And but on the 12th of the 12th, he said something to me that I knew was seed that was planted in my heart that I had been carrying since I was 14 years old, but that God had also placed in his heart. And mm -hmm. so that is how Succeed was born. It was born from a seed that God had placed in both our hearts. Um, a few weeks later, um, Patrick Stevens joined our team as the co-director. And so it was Richard Maestri, myself and Patrick, and the rest, as they say, is history. And that is how Succeed was born. And Succeed was born out of conversations and about just connecting people in what I call a God incidence, not mm. a coincidence, but mm. a God incidence. And Succeed is really a, a nonprofit organization. We, we have four thematic areas we're looking after. Firstly, we've got Rebel, which is a, a women's, uh, it's Women's Month this month, and we're promoting this, and we're really excited about this project. The next thing is about agriculture and having really uh, our vision is to see every home in South Africa have their own little garden in whatever way that is. And also then um, we're looking at entrepreneurship, we're looking at taking this and how do we make, how do we preserve people's dignity in mm. a way that makes them self-sustaining, you know? And the last bit is to take coding, which is quite a, um, a out there kind of thing at the moment for me as well, but to take coding to um to everybody and we've got a program designed already and we want to make it available we want to take it out of the elitists we want all our young people to be on the same platform so we're very excited at succeed and we welcome you this afternoon so on behalf of richard maestri patrick stevens and myself nishani ford we are just so excited um and without any further ado i want to introduce my dear friend my sister in Christ, uh, my buddy, my girl, uh, Jenna Lee Belong. Uh, Jenna is a, uh, well, she's a, a TV anchor. She's a well sought after public speaker. She is the author of some published books and um, pastor of the church. Um, and her story is incredible. How this beautiful woman came to be to where she is today is an incredible journey. It's been an incredible journey, Jenna. And without further ado, I just want to say welcome to Succeed. Welcome. And um, we're just so excited to have you. So, Thank you so much. Floor Thank is you. yours. Floor is Thank yours. you so much, Nishani, and uh, everybody who's watching. It's a great privilege for me to be on your program. Uh, you've been doing some great things, and I know you're going to be speaking to even greater people. And I love the work that you do. You know that I love you, and anything you do, I just love it, and I want to be there and support it. But um, yes, it. My story is. I don't know. It's my reality. So when I tell it to other people, sometimes they can get a bit shocked, um, they get sad, uh, they feel all kinds of emotions, but for me, it's my reality and it is my strength. I got my tissues. <laughs> You've got it. No crying today, no crying today. So, so it's, it's, it's my, been my reality and it's also my strength in the sense that I get my power and my purpose was born out of the testimony of the things that I've been through. So when I share it, I always say people should not be sad. They should not be crying for me. They should be celebrating because if God could do it for me, my sister, he can definitely do it for someone else as well. I come from a, a small town called Bonnyvale in the Western Cape, stayed there until the age of eight. From there, moved to um, a town called Worcester. And I grew up there until I moved to Cape Town to work and then eventually ended up in Johannesburg. But somewhere in this journey, there is a story of a sense of abandonment when my father left me and um, he was never really part of my life, my biological father. 
And from that sense of abandonment, which is now I know it was abandonment, but all those years ago, I didn't know it's a sense of abandonment, a sense yeah. of belonging that I'm looking for. But out of that situation with my biological father um, was born this incredible need to belong, this incredible need to just have someone's surname and be somebody something. Mm. And I remember my mother got uh, married again. I was about eight years old, uh, had my, my baby brother and they all had the same surname. It was an issue for me because I didn't have their surname. I had mm -hmm. my grandmother's surname. So it just made me so incredibly sad and feel like I don't really fit in. I don't belong. I was raised by my grandmother for a long time. When I was 15 years old, she got um, cancer and I left school at that stage. I was 15. I was doing my, I was doing grade nine. I left grade nine and I went to, on to go do my matric that same year at the age of 15. And I went to go and look after my grandmother. So here's a 15 year old girl looking after her dying grandmother, seeking wow. for a sense of belonging, seeking for a sense of who am I, a sense of identity as well. My grandmother ended up passing away and that made it worse for me, Nishani, because I was an omakant. I was my grandmother's child yes. and now she's yes. gone. Who am I now if my grandmother is not there? So things kind of began spiraling after that. Um, I got involved in wrong relationships. I actually was uh, at some point smoking marijuana, like you can't believe it. I was smoking dacha, I was drinking, I can sing. So I was hanging out with the Rastas in the squatter camp, <laughs> singing, writing songs. And I just felt like I belonged here with these great people, these people that they're not from my culture, they're not from my religion, but they're accepting me. And I was yeah. lost at that stage. So I ended up in a squatter camp, uh, drinking, um, uh, doing all kinds of things that you can imagine in relationships with men that makes absolutely no sense. Um, somewhere between the age of 15 and 18, I got raped more than once. One of them was a gang rape and um, mm -hmm. That happened to me when I was 18 years old. I decided I'm going to marry the first guy that looks like he loves me, but was also abusing me. Um, got married to him for four years. I mean, all kinds of things happened to me in that marriage as well. Uh, I was abused. I was dragged by my hair. Many, many things happened and I almost died. I remember running away from hospital one day. They wanted to, I, I had faked Nishani. I faked a suicide to get out of the house in order for me to survive because I was that night I thought I was going to die and the only way for me to get out of the house I know to somebody watching it might not make sense but I thought let me act like I killed myself so that they can take me to the hospital and I can get out that night they wanted to pump my stomach because I told them that I had taken bleach and uh, all of that. I ran away from hospital. So many things could have happened to me. Ended up being left for another woman. Um, could never finish my studies until today because I always had to just fight to survive, I had to fight to, to stay alive and, and to stay one up. But by the grace of God, somehow he caused me to remember who I was in him. By the grace of God, somehow through the abuse, through the rape, through the sense of abandonment, God uh, managed, because you see my grandmother and my mother gave me a very solid foundation of God. So we yeah. didn't have money, we didn't have much, but we had God. So somehow after the age of 18 at around 2021, I rediscovered who I was in Christ. He brought me back to my true identity in him. And listen, uh, he ex accelerated me in ways that uh, is not normal. Like you said, I'm one of um, the few Afrikaans television news anchors in the country. Uh, I am loved by many people. I've authored uh, more than one book. I've sold thousands of copies of my book. I have radio program on radio pulpit. And before that, I was a national radio, SABC, all of that. Um, I got remarried to the most incredible man. You know, my husband, Bishop Ed Belong. Yes, 
Yes, and, and all of that, Nishani, happened simply because of one thing, because of the grace of God, because of one, it's the love of God. He chased after me. He, he showed me years later how he was protecting me through all of this that was happening to me. And today, as I sit here, I am a healed woman. I am victorious. Uh, there's so many things that happened to me that I've not even spoken about in public yet. I mean, I've been bullied in the corporate world. All those things happen to you, but the grace of God sustains me. The grace of God keeps me and has helped me to be where I am today. And I'm nowhere near where I'm supposed to be yet. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you for your courage. I just want to honor your, your courage. It's not easy to share something like this. Um, so thank you for being so, so um, just honoring God in your life in such a, in a, such a transparent way, you know, to have been gang raped and, and I know some of the stories of your abuse and, and the use of a hammer on your head. I remember those stories, you know, um, and to, to see you and to know you today is, is truly an incredible miracle. But tell me, tell me what it was like really to be hanging out and living in those squatter camps. <laughs> as a six-year-old tell us what it's like most of us have never had that experience listen you will see i, I wrote in one of my books that some of the the in, in Joburg they call them zozos some of those yes. uh, uh, some of those homes are cleaner they are really cleaner than some of the mansions i've been in you will see <laughs> that the sofas that they buy, they keep them wrapped up in, in plastic. Nobody must yeah. sit on it, they value it every day. The aunties, we are cleaning our homes. And I have to tell you that I never once felt unsafe in the squatter camp. Not, I know that maybe I was naive because I should have been scared. I should have known that things can happen to me yes. uh, uh, in the squatter camp. I felt so loved. Uh, I, I learned a bit of Tosa because they spoke East Tosa in the, in the squatter camp. So I learned my way around the squatter camp and I felt loved. I felt accepted. And mm. even though that was not ideal, it was not where I'm supposed to be. I learned a lot of things from those people. They, I'm telling you, sometimes you drive past the squatter camp and you think that there are just people who they are nobody. You know, yeah. they don't need to think about yeah. it. These are people who are lazy. They don't want to be anyone in life. I'm telling you, in those squatter camps, you will find gems, jewels, people with yes. such great potential. Some of the best singers I've ever met, I met there. Some of the best poets I ever met, I met there. And really, these are loving people. And there's a great sense of community in the squatter mm. camp that yes. until today, I don't find in the suburbs at all. I loved it. I loved it and it's just the grace of God that got me out of there to be honest. <laughs> so how did you go from a squatter camp to being a presenter and a producer of your own show by the age of 22? You know you say God accelerated you but I mean I'm sure he didn't whack a magic wand. You know, he doesn't do that. <laughs> yes. But what happened? Tell us. It's a lot of hard work, you're right. Let me tell you that when I was about 15 years old, same year, 15, 16, yeah. when my grandmother passed, I had left school and I had time on my hands because now I was doing my matric by correspondence. Um, I had law subjects. Those years, they still allowed you to do a law matric. So I had law subjects and it was pretty easy doing it by correspondence. And um, I had some time on my hands and the local community radio station had just opened up yeah. and I got so, I had a pull towards the radio station. When I was uh, at high school, I started a, a school newspaper as well. I've always been good with language and words. Yeah. So when the radio station opened, I told my mother that I'd like to go and join the radio station went into the radio station. I've always been bold like that until today. I'm not shy to ask and knock on doors. 15 year old girl, girl knows nothing about radio. When then I told them, I have an idea that yes. will be very great for them. I want to host um, high school debates on air. The manager looked at me and long story short, he ended up giving me an opportunity. And since the age of 15, listen, many things went wrong in my life. Uh, 
it, it, all around in my personal life, spiritually things went wrong. But the one thing that always stayed was the, the media. So since the yeah. age of 15, I never left broadcasting. Never. I was living in a squatter camp, still volunteering at my local radio station. Okay. So wow. um, because of that, by the time that I was 22 and I got, I went to work at the SABC, National Broadcast yes. at the age of 22, I had so much experience more than some of the people who studied for years, who've been in radio for 40 years. I knew how to operate every software you can think of because I taught myself and I stayed loyal to my purpose because I had this feeling in me that I'm called for this media thing. So I really stayed loyal on, on public holidays when my friends were out drinking and dancing. I was that boring girl standing with a mic in the supermarket doing a live broadcast for my local radio station. So I really stayed very committed and I worked very, very hard. I think that's also why towards the end of last year, I burned out a bit because since yeah. the age of 15, I was working and working and working to prove myself and, and to come up to get some sort of light. So oh. yeah, you have to stay committed, Nishani, to your purpose have to yeah it's quite interesting you say that you've learned you learned so much at the squatter camp and you had a sense of belonging and yet it was almost a false sense of belonging and i wonder how many young people today are looking for that sense of belonging because of the abandonment that they feel and um you and i both know i've seen you on the streets in newlands um running uh community work through your your church there and um you know, I'm often, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm often wary about where I parked the car and how I, you know, how I arrived there because it's quite, a, it, it feels unsafe. Yet, you seem to own those streets as a lady belong um, and work with those individuals. What drew you to Newlands? And just tell us a little bit about Newlands because it seems to be that that is the community of people who just don't have anywhere to go that are completely abandoned by society yeah I think it's so important what you're saying because um, there is also a lot of stigma around yeah. uh, communities such as Newlands and mm. to be honest with you you see me feeling safe there because I am safe there you see yeah. me feeling comfortable there because I am and the people that are in Newlands and any other community that you can think of the, yeah. It's God's people. It, it, it is first and foremost, it is God's people. Like I said to you in the squatter camp, I, I learned that these are people. I am from the squatter camp and yeah. I am a person. Um, mm. I'm God's child. So myself and my husband, we have this incredible pull uh, towards community development uh, to our own detriment sometimes because there's no money in it so you're forever trying to survive so we have this pull towards developing communities helping people to realize their own purpose and the dream and yeah. God's vision for them so when we went there we went there with the sole purpose to develop people to love people because not everyone that you see on the street perhaps he's addicted to drugs right now but there's a story behind yes. there. There yes. is a mother behind there. There's a family behind there. There's a yes. soul. There's a spirit with a purpose behind there. Yes. And I know that sometimes we can be scared. I also want to say as somebody who works in news that we must be careful of the propaganda and the agendas that's being pushed uh, yes. through news outlets. Sometimes all the things you are seeing being reported on, it's very small in comparison to the rest of the great things and the great people that are in these communities. Yes. So in Newlands, you will find people that just need an opportunity, but also you will find people that need help to develop their character because yes. it is your character that helps you to sustain the positions and the opportunities that you are given. Uh, I'm able to sustain my calling by my character, not just because somebody gave me an opportunity and I knew something or I knew someone. Mm. So I believe that we as the church and we as people, we need to go back to these communities and empower people, develop their character, teach them yeah. how to do simple things like clean your house, how to iron your clothes, how to be excellent at your workplace, 
the rest God will do. The rest mm. the world will do. But we have a responsibility, I believe, to teach communities how to build their own character so that they can sustain the opportunities that will come their way. Because people will give you a job, but if you have no character, you're going to mess, mess it up. And I believe that's where the word of God comes in because the more you learn about God, the more your character develops, the more, the closer you see, the closer you get to God, the more yeah. you see yourself as well. So we are there to help people and there are great people that you don't need to be scared. I'm telling you now. <laughs> no, I'm not scared. I love the children there. You know that I love the, the, the kids there. Very much. <laughs> Yes, and you've done great things uh, for, for them as well. I think the key is, I was looking at, at what some of our children this morning in church, yeah. and I think the key is to be a, a, a reliable presence in their life. Because also sometimes we go into communities, we do something and we disappear again. Yeah. And it teaches them something about themselves. So what we're trying to, be, to do at the moment is to be a reliable con constant presence in the lives of the people we don't always have all the money we need to do the things that we'd like to do for them and to the opportunities but if you can just be there for someone constantly consistently reliably so then you're teaching them that they are valuable you're teaching them that they matter and yeah. even in our friendships i encourage us today be consistent you don't need yeah. all the money you don't need to come and do wow things for them just be there they just need you to be there. And um, you speak about character and developing people's character, uh, biblically and, and otherwise. What, what do you think is key to having that ca character that sustains you and that pushes you forward as an individual? I think the key is what I just mentioned, uh, understanding who you are in Christ. Christ. Okay. You must understand who you are, uh, not just in Christ, but who you are in, in the big picture. Who are you? What is your role in the big picture? Because it's very difficult for me to act out of character once mm. I know my identity. Mm. You see, mm. it's like when you discover you are a princess yes. in some kingdom somewhere. It becomes so difficult for you to act out of character because immediately once you understand your identity and your position, there, yes. there, there are structures around you. There are structures around you uh, that really keeps you a bit within your, within your box. You can't just act out of character. You're the princess of the kingdom. You can't just act out of character. You, you are a representative of God. So when once I know that, it helps me to stay within character. And if you don't know who you are, you won't know what you're supposed to act like. Yes. You won't know like what is okay for me to do, what is not okay for, for me to do. But key to developing your character is understanding who you are in Christ. I am a daughter of God. I represent him, therefore I cannot take bribes. That would be out of character for a daughter yes. of God. I'm a yes. daughter of God. I represent him. Therefore, I know I'm beautiful, even though people say I'm not. Uh, therefore, I cannot be abused. That's out of character for a daughter of God. I um, am a daughter of God. Therefore, I cannot go around hating people and cursing them and holding grudges. That's yes. out of character for a daughter of God. But I only know that because I know who I am. I yeah. only know that because I know who I am. So those of you who are watching, I'm seeing Anusha, Chetty, and all of you guys, Sarah, Elsa, I see you guys. I believe it's key, Nishani, that we, we know who we are in Christ and that we teach our children their true identity, that there's power in their identity. You can overcome because of who you are. There's certain things that the president can do just because of the fact that he's the president. President, true. Exactly. And there's certain things that you can do just by nature of the fact that you are a daughter of God, you've got access to certain things, um, but you won't know it until you've realized uh, your true identity in Christ. And speaking about identity, Jenna, um, and I want to go back to the fact that we are living in the rape capital of the world. Um, Johannesburg, sadly, is, is the rape capital of the world. Our stats are not even going to go there because I can get quite hyped up about that. But being in, in that space and knowing you've come out of this, you've come out of abuse, you've come out of dire abuse, you've come out of a, a, a first marriage, 
you've come out of gang rape, other rapes, and yet you have found your identity. What would you say is key to some, somebody listening in today who has been in that situation, who probably maybe hasn't even acknowledged that or been given the platform or even been heard? Because most times people don't believe a woman when she says she's been raped or, or molested. Um, and so what would be your advice? Because somehow there is something I know personally for myself, it took me years when I look in the mirror, I couldn't see beautiful. I could not see beautiful. And even though people say I'm beautiful, even now, I have still got to, to work that out in my head, you know? And it's only because of my identity in Christ that I can accept that, okay, somebody says I'm beautiful, I must be beautiful then. But I didn't always see it. And it took me mm. years to develop that. It didn't, mm. it didn't happen, you know, in a flash. And, it, and I still struggle with it sometimes. So what would you say to women watching this today who, who are in that space? Yeah, I think that the key is that it's a process. So um, once you realize that it's a process, it really helps you to, to, to be patient with yourself. It helps you to not say, well, Nishani and Jenna Lee, they are over it or they are up yes. there now. They're even yeah. doing live Zooms, talking to people. I'm also tomorrow just going to do it. <laughs> you know? um, sometimes when we just say, find your identity in God or get closer to God and it'll be okay. It can be a bit deceiving because then the yes. person will think that it's going to happen tomorrow. So yes. I think for me, the key is that you must first of all acknowledge that it's in, it's a process and you yes. are a work in progress. Um, the first thing I had to tell myself was that, okay, this is not going to break me. This is not going to break me. I'm still alive. I have a purpose uh, it's not going to break me. So I'm going to deal with it. I'm not going to die. Okay. I'm going to, yeah. you have to first determine that I'm going to live and I'm going to live a life of purpose. And I, you have to get kind of aggressive and say, no, I want to be happy. Acknowledge that. No, listen, I want to feel beautiful. Yeah. You've got to be right for yourself, right? For yourself. Um, you, you must get aggressive, aggressive and say, I don't feel beautiful right now. I feel a bit overweight. And, and maybe some of the things that my abusers have said to me might be true. And I'm not there yet where I'm confident to say I'm free, mm. but determine in yourself that you want that freedom, that you want that purpose. Determine in yourself that you want to break free from the victim mentality and you want to live in the victorious glory that God has for you. And once you've yes. determined that, now start the process. Now start the work. And it is yeah. really, I, Nishani, if I have to tell you all the, process, the processes I had to go through, uh, I will take forever. It started with me asking God, Okay, let me start with you. Where were you when I was raped? Yeah. L yeah. Let me start with you, God, because without you, I'm not going to be able to even finish this process. Yeah. Where were you when I was being hit with a hammer? Where were you when I was being dragged with my, with my, uh, by my hair in the streets? Where were you, God? So that yeah. process for me started there and God really had to reveal his heart to me to show me how it broke him, yeah. to show me that he didn't choose for these people to do this to me, mm. that he gave every human freedom of choice, that those, he, he doesn't interfere when it comes to our, our choices because he wants it to even be a choice that we worship him. He doesn't interfere. He doesn't force us. Yes. He created us and now it's up to us what we do with this life. So God showed me how it broke his heart. God showed me where he was, how he was protecting even my face, Nishani. God showed me that I don't have a single scar on my face today that comes from abuse or anything because of my purpose. God knew I had to be on television. So he had to protect me. He was protecting my heart. He was there and it broke him yeah. what happened to me. So I went through that process of just re, uh, re uh, uniting myself with God and getting rid of all yes. the questions that I had towards him. I went through a process where I had to look at myself in the mirror naked and say you are beautiful 
you are beautiful. I did that for maybe a year, Nishani, every day looking at myself in the mirror because I didn't believe it. I used to believe I have the ugliest hair. I used to believe I have an ugly nose. I used to believe I have a flat face and I would just look at myself and think, you know, I did a plat gesicht. You have a flat face and... So I had to look at myself in the mirror every single day. I went through the process of forgiveness. Yes. That's another one. Forgiving those who wronged you. God took me through the fact that when I forgive those who, who wronged me, who raped me, who abused me, it's not saying what they did to me is okay. It is saying that I am okay. Yeah. That 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 and, and I God said to me, until you can pray for them to get to heaven until you can pray for 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 them to share heaven with you because <laughs> they gonna <laughs> oh, that's a good one yes oh, until a good to, yes until you're ready to do that um you are not ready to really uh, forgive so i went through the whole process yeah. of forgiveness i went through counseling i went through um uh, so many things looking at habits that came from the past because now I was becoming an abuser myself yeah. I was now abusing people and shouting at them and doing all kinds of things yeah. because of what happened to me in the past and then the most important thing is back to where I began earlier I had to go through the process of finding my identity in God because that's oh. where freedom comes but I'm explaining it like this Nishani and I mean I could go on I'm explaining it like this to emphasize to someone watching that it's a process and that there are different layers to it and you should not rush yourself but yeah. determine in your heart that you're going to get free you're going to be free you're going to live a victorious life and then start crawling slowly but surely going yeah. through that process but but the start like you said the start is knowing your identity and finding your space in God first, even if you go to him, even if you go to him with the difficult questions, you know, um, uh, having gone through many um, similar experiences, not the same, but similar experiences in my own life. Um, one of the things that I was very tempted to ask God was why, you know, where are you? Why? And, you know, Gently, as, as God spoke to me and as, as, we, as we engaged in this, in this process of healing, God said to me, can you stop asking me why and ask me who? Who was I in the midst of all of that? And when you understand the Father heart of God, you, understand, you start to understand, you know, what breaks God's heart is what you went through as, as his daughter. And um, when you start to see that, you know, uh, and you start to understand that, um, and you start to see who God is in the midst of that pain, you begin to understand your sense of belonging, your sense of who. Absolutely. And you know, I, I was struggling with identity for so long. And once yeah. I realized that I'm generally, I was, <laughs> I was asking God, who am I generally who? Because my mother had this <laughs> one surname and uh, my grandmother had this other surname. I never had my biological yes. father's surname. And um, now I was stuck with this ugly surname that I didn't like yes. from my past and all of that. And God said to me <laughs> one day, you are generally God. <laughs> generally God? <laughs> Generally God, like that's like, that's your, and back then I didn't even truly understand what it means. It's now while my husband is teaching on, uh, uh, on, a, on the vision of God and teaching us on the identity that I'm, yeah. that I'm starting to, to understand what God meant. I am generally God. I'm, I'm, I'm his. I am. Yes. That's where I slot and, and in. Isn't it, isn't it funny that you marry a man and he gives you the surname belong? I was saying, if you, if you think God doesn't have a sense of humor, then really you don't know my God. When I um, got the surname and it's belong, I was saying to the Lord, this is so funny. I was looking for a place of belonging my whole life. And now God yes. said, okay, not only am I going to give it to you, I'm going to make it your identity. You are generally belong. You belong somewhere. And that surname... Yes comes from Cameroon. My husband is a Basa man from Cameroon and it means nations. So I am literally generally of the nations. I belong to the nations. So God wow. has a sense of humor. How prophetic, eh? Very prophetic. God, God definitely has a sense of humor. And I must say, I'm going to have to ask you, I mean, you and Bishop Ed make marriage look like a slice of heaven. 
how what is the secret after all that you both have been through um to just being such covenant partners beautiful beautiful man and wife and uh just you know seeing you guys together working in 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 um newlands it's incredible it's inspiring and incredible what's the secret work it's a lot of work <laughs> it's a lot of work let me tell you that me and my husband we are both in our second marriages yeah and um it is so incredibly important to us to make our marriage work and both of us we've learned a lot of things from from our past things that 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 was done wrong and things that we did wrong and we we were so blessed when we found each other because when i found my husband i found exactly what i needed i found yeah. my place of safety my husband is the most gentle person you will ever find he will never harm okay he does kill a few flies for me so i don't want to say he will harm a fly <laughs> but he's he's extremely gentle so i found everything that i was looking for he found everything that he was looking for and now yeah. we are in a place to say god brought us to each other um how do we protect this so we put in a lot of work um it was it, it's not easy i don't want to make it look easy it's not easy you yeah. have to put in the work and the holy spirit honestly gives us a lot of of guidance on on marriage and how to make it work we make sure that there's always open communication so we talk yeah. a lot we spend a lot of time together talking about things that i don't know that make sense some of it the words some of it just fun and we compromise we are both very compromising he watches some things with me that you maybe won't think that a bishop would watch he will watch stuff with me and i do things with him that you maybe think i won't do and we spend a lot of time together um studying each other i always say that i need to have a phd in in my husband and he has a phd in me he studies me and he does the things that i love and i do the things that he loves and we try to make sure that there's always that time for romance because when you are doing ministry together you yeah. can easily very easily become ministry partners or become business partners so we yeah. make sure that the romance is there uh, some of you who who have my phone number will know that sometimes you all uh, you will see some jokes there and you know we are normal people we make sure we have fun so that the ministry can stay intact because if something happens yeah between me and him our ministry will suffer if yes. something happens between me and him there's so many people dependent on us so we also understand the responsibility we have to look after our marriage thank you thanks for being so honest so do you have any questions about rebel for me absolutely i saw you holding up rebel's box and i've been first of all i love the box and i love anything that comes in a box so this is it hey so i i was i thought i thought you were going to say that i i won something called rebel and I, <laughs> i was excited to get the box so tell me about rebel what is it what's in that box so so let me tell you what's in the box it is reusable sanitary towels with uh you know some bags and and, and be, it's beautifully made what what's exciting about this is that it can last a girl or woman up to 5 years that and little I box mean, that little box has got everything to last her for 5 years of her a menstrual cycle so you can imagine i mean jenna last year i went to the eastern cape and you know that i i i lived among the people there and worked there and you know one of the things that really broke my heart was the fact that women were using almost mini leaves they didn't even have loo paper you know um it was it was a very it was a very heartbreaking experience for me and one of the things that i wanted to bring back or wanted to 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 help with was to be able to get them the get these into their hands um you know it's not only for the rural ladies or the rural women we find that 75% of absenteeism in schools is due to the fact that a girl has a period and cannot afford a sanitary sanitary wear it seems quite um, you know it seems quite like it surely everybody can afford it but actually for me it's very personal it's extremely personal i want to say to you that for me the choice that a woman has or a girl has to make between buying sanitary pads and buying a loaf of bread and you would identify with this is a violent choice yeah. and i want to take that violence choice away you know 
um, it's not good that, that she is. So what we're asking for right now is support and we, we, we want partners to partner with us to get this into the girls' hands. Um, mm -hmm. And that is what Seeds of Hope is doing. We want to plant seeds. We want to restore dignity to women and girls. We really well, want to restore <laughs> dignity to them. Can I tell you, Nishani, that I'm, I'm so blessed by what you are saying uh, you, you're doing, and it's reminding me of, of my journey with sanitary yeah. pads. Let, let me tell you that for just one minute. I know our yes, time. Yes, absolutely. No, absolutely. It's running out. I, you talking about loop paper, I use toilet paper many, many, many times. Mm. And I mean, I've even used um, T-shirts. Yes. I've walked around with T-shirts. Uh, yeah. instead of a sanitary pad and you don't know what that does to someone's confidence you can yeah. be the most gifted person you can be the most intelligent person when you walking around with uh with something in you that is not supposed to be for that purpose yeah. it's a terrible thing so i i absolutely love what you guys are doing tell me how do you get it how do you distribute it so we have a distributor so it's made by people who are unemployed um, and we distributed, we've got a, a network of, um, you know, the nonprofit network across the country. Um, and so when we get donations, we collate those donations and then we arrange a distribution. Oh, so wow. it depends where the donor would want to have them distributed. Sometimes, look, my heart is in the Eastern Cape, but, um, you know, we're not limited to that. We're absolutely not limited to that. And if people we are just we really just want to get these out, yeah. And if people are watching and maybe they have a need, what, what do they do? Okay, so you can go to the Facebook page, Succeed, S-U-C-S-E-E-D. Please like the page and there is contact information on there. Um, so if you can please contact us and let us know uh, whether you have a need, whether you'd like to partner with us, if you have any questions, we're very, very willing to engage. So please just make contact and uh, let's start a conversation. Let's start uh, being practical about how we address violence against women. Absolutely, you know? absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Amazing work you're doing. Thank you so Thank much. You. No, it's a pleasure, Jenna. Tell me, we're coming to the close. I just want to touch sides with you about your book, uh, Church Girl. Yes. I love the title. And it says, you, you know, it speaks to us who are always called. We always have had this, this need, this calling. And especially as women in ministry, you know, it's, it's not always, um, it's, it hasn't always been open. And sometimes we've got cultural backgrounds that we've got to deal with. Uh, but some of us have always been church girls. From the time we were little, we were preaching somewhere, even if it was to the dolls. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I'm also, I've been a church girl my whole life. Uh, obviously, I've backslidden and I've dabbled in, in some things, yeah. but this it always stays in you. You know, once that foundation is laid, um, yeah. you can never unchurch yourself. You'll always yeah. be a church girl. So I wrote that book, Church Girl Problems, uh, because God was speaking to me about the fact that as women of God, we face the same problems that any other woman would face. You are not exempt. I don't subscribe to the teachings that say, come to Jesus and everything is going to be okay. Uh -uh, yeah. that, that's a lie. You come to God, everything will eventually be okay because he's going to get you through it. But you do face challenges as a woman in relationships. Yeah. We get divorced. We have to decide what we wear. We have problems with fashion. We have problems at our workplace. There's one chapter called Boss Babe. We are boss babes. We mm. are executives. So God said to me that the only difference between you and other women is that you must handle your problems like a church girl. Ah, so you have okay. them, but handle it like a church girl. <laughs> I spoke of some of the most uh, prominent questions that I get yes. from girls all over the world asking me advice on, on uh, relationships, how to choose a boy, a, a, a partner, after divorce, what do you do, um, being a, um, a boss or an, a, a professional person yes. as a woman of God, how do you act, how do you handle those problems and many other problems, sexuality, all those things, I spoke of in the book, hence it's called Church Girl Problems, ah. and I, 
I deal with the church girl, something I call church girl syndrome. Uh, it was uh, oh. transmitted to you through blood. It was a, a blood transmitted, uh, uh, let me call a disease that we received through the blood of Jesus that you are oh. now infected with. Church girl syndrome is in you and it's never going anywhere, whether you are preaching on the stoop like I did when I was small or whether I'm sitting up here in Job in a house, I have church girl syndrome. And out of that book was also born a brand called Church Girl. Yes. You see me wearing the faith I earrings. I love your earrings, yes. Yes, it is, it is part of my brand. I have earrings, I have lipstick, I have Esther lipstick, Naomi lipstick, Ruth lipsticks, quality wow. lipsticks. This is that wonderful. Yes, I have face masks and we're busy developing many other products. You can yes. go to my website, churchgirl.co.za, because I believe that we need to affirm our identity as women of God. And I want to be uh, to build a brand that will host everything and anything for the church girl. So that's in a nutshell what that is about. And I'm busy with my new book called Rotten Potatoes. Great. Wonderful. Good luck with the new book. And Jenna, in summary, we're coming now to a close um, as our time closes. Um, we are, this is about planting seeds of hope. Well, in a nutshell, what is the seed of hope that you want to plant in the middle of this global pandemic and the crisis that we're in? What is your, um, your seed of hope? Nishani, I honestly find my hope in God. So I know I sound like a stuck record when I keep referring to God, but my hope is in God and I can face tomorrow because he lives like that. The old hymn says, I can stand in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic because of him. And once again, once you realize who you are in God, you start living from a higher reality. And that's my challenge yeah. to all of you who are watching today. Live from a higher reality live from a different place and understand that you are in this place, but you don't live from here. You are not from here. You are not sustained by it. You are not part of it. Uh, yes. And once you take that position, then you have hope because the minute you see yourself as part of the world going through this thing yeah. uh, or going through many challenges, you can start uh, losing hope. But once you realize I'm living from a different reality, I am operating from a higher level of spirituality. When I say spirituality, I don't mean something who, I mean your relationship with God and who you are in Christ. Um, then you have hope. And I want to encourage someone who might still be in the middle of a storm. Um, it sounds insensitive when I say this, but you're not the first one to go through it and you're, you're not going to be the last. And you will one. it. You will get through it. There are many, many other people, millions of other people who went through the same things me and you went through and they survived. Maybe they're just not talking about it, but they are surviving, they overcame and so will you. This thing is not bigger than you. This problem you are facing is not bigger than you. Your God is bigger than that problem. Your God is bigger than that obstacle. Your God can go and fetch your child from wherever he is. Your child, your God can fix your marriage. Your God can provide for all your financial, emotional, and every other need. Your God is bigger than your problem and your God is bigger than the devil. So don't <laughs> you give up hope. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jenna Lee. That, that's, that's an incredible, I almost want to say preach it. <laughs> <laughs> So, so thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your life with us. Thank you for sharing your time. Uh, I know you rushed from a board meeting. So thank you so much for making this time and for carving it out of your, your calendar. Um, I must say it's wonderful to, to have sisters like you. When I say, will you do something before you even know what it is, you say, of course. Yes, of course. Anytime <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> Anytime I'm there, before I even tell you what it's about. So yeah. thank you. Thank you. I really just want to honor you and thank you for your courage and your vulnerability. Um, I also just want to say a very big thank you to the team that supports me behind this, the VI team, and to uh, Richard Maestri, as well as Patrick. Uh, Richard, especially, he's the uh, uh, appointed uh, producer <laughs> of the show. So thank you so much. Um, and from Seeds of Hope and from Succeed, I just want to say, you know, may God bless you. May God make his face to shine upon you. 
May you continue to be hopeful and to shine as flickers of hope in this world of darkness. God bless you and have a good, good evening. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Jenna Lee. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much. God bless you.